So fuel efficiency is a hot topic for many drivers. But in this video, we're going to look at some common fuel saving myths, some things that people believe are true, but they aren't. You won't get substantial fuel economy. And I found that some of these myths exist because they used to be true. The way cars and engines used to work required you to do certain things, but that doesn't always apply on modern engines. And some of these things are just down to clever marketing claims made by people selling these things that will save you fuel. So after this video, you'll have a complete overview on which fuel saving things work. And if it's a myth that's originated from a situation that we needed to do years ago, you'll understand why and how things have changed. One of the most common things that people often say is to over inflate your tires because that will save you fuel. Now that's come from an understanding that under inflated tires waste fuel. In fact, some estimates are that a 5 PSI loss in tyre pressure can result in a 2% loss of fuel economy. It's substantial really that you can reduce the amount of fuel you're wasting by inflating your tyre to the correct pressure. But what happens when you go beyond the correct pressure? Well, your tyre stops being flat, it starts being curved, so you've got less rolling resistance. That may well reduce your fuel consumption because you're rolling on much narrower tyres, but that's going to adversely affect the handling of the car, the braking, the cornering are going to be dangerously affected depending on how extreme you've actually gone. But also the life of the tyre, you'll notice that tyres that are overinflated wear in the middle very, very quickly. So the cost of replacing your tyres more often will usually outweigh any of those minor fuel savings you've had. Plus you've had the additional problems of the handling compromises that you've made in order to achieve that. It's better overall if you're really that worried about the friction of the tyres to source energy efficient tyres. I use the Michelin Energy on my car and that gave me about three to four mpg that was the overall average during the period the tires were on over a couple of years so it gave a good benchmark they did save me a little bit of fuel economy but your results are going to vary depending on your car the tire size and your driving style you may not see any benefits at all going to an eco tire now also related to tires is filling them with nitrogen nitrogen molecules are, are bigger they're less likely to dissipate so it's a good way of maintaining Maintaining pressure in your tyre over a period of time. But is it really worth filling your car's tyres with nitrogen? Well, bear in mind that air, the compressed air that goes into your tyre, already contains about 78% nitrogen. So we're only talking about that 22% difference. Now, when you go back to your tyre after a few months, it's lost some air pressure. Now, it's predominantly the oxygen molecules that have evaporated or escaped through the walls of the tyre. So you're replacing those oxygen molecules with another 78% of nitrogen, 22% of oxygen. So as time goes on, you're going to be left with a higher concentration of nitrogen in your tyre anyway. Will it make a difference? Is nitrogen lighter? Well, in the grand scheme of things, you're really wasting your time. In a competition environment, every little thing you can do to improve the car's performance or handling or to maintain consistent pressures as the tyres heat up, they will go to great lengths to achieve that. So you may well see motorsport teams using nitrogen, but for the cost involved and the benefits you'll get, it's a complete waste of time. People often say that driving slower on the highways, the motorways, the freeways will save you fuel. Now that's true to an extent. We know that if you travel at 70 or 80 miles an hour, you're going to use far more fuel than if you travel at 50 or 60 miles an hour. But that doesn't always relate to the very low end. So if you were dribbling along at 30 miles an hour or less than that, there's very little drag affecting the car. So many would say that that improves the fuel economy, but your journey times are going to be much longer. Cars are typically designed with a power band and generally manufacturers have optimized the speed of around 50 to 60 miles an hour for fuel economy purposes. So if you drive at that speed in the correct gear, I've done another video or quite a few other videos discussing gear selection and how this affects fuel economy, you're going to make more savings than driving at stupidly low speeds, annoying all of the other drivers. Yes, it's true that the faster you go, the more fuel you use, but it doesn't practically correlate to going much slower bringing great increases in fuel economy. So as long as you avoid those extremely high speeds where you're dealing with a lot more wind resistance, you're going to see a fuel saving. But think about your journey time 
that is a big factor. Your time is precious. Whatever you save in fuel, you don't want to be spending that in lost wages or just general inconvenience. But another thing people say is that using the air conditioning wastes fuel. You'll notice when the air conditioner cuts in on a car, it saps power. You feel that the car's less responsive when that air conditioning cuts in. So that leads people to conclude that using the air conditioning is wasting fuel. Now, two things to think about. The other option, if you're in the car on a hot day, you can either treat it like a sauna, dress appropriately, and have a cold shower every sort of 10 or 15 minutes, or you can open the window. Now, if you open the window on a car that's traveling at speed, the increased drag that you create is going to cost you fuel economy. So in most cases, in most instances, in that situation, it is better to have the windows closed and the air conditioner on. Now, the mistake a lot of people make is to turn the air conditioning right down. So if you've got climate control and you can set a temperature in your car, it's generally best to set it to just be below ambient. And if it's got a recirculation mode, that can also reduce the strain on the air conditioner. It depends how much energy is coming into the car from the sun. But generally, if you're sucking warm air in and having to cool that warm air down, it would be less effort to just cool the air that is already in the cabin. But you've got to think as well about the stuffiness that you're getting inside the cabin. But certainly, Increasing the temperature so it's just below ambient will save you some fuel economy. And that also avoids that situation where you get out of a cold car on a warm day and you feel that heat hit you. And that can be quite oppressive or overbearing at times. So fuel additives improve your mileage that you get, your fuel economy. Well, in the main, most additives don't make that much of a difference to your fuel economy. And a lot of additives actually work by cleaning the injectors. So if the injectors aren't spraying cleanly into the engine, you're going to be down on fuel economy. The engine is going to be less efficient. But a lot of these additives just restore the fuel economy to where it should be. But most of the fuel that we buy has already got additives in it that are designed to clean the fuel system in the car to keep it running efficiently. Depending on where you buy the fuel, it depends on what additive pack is in that fuel. But generally, the more expensive fuels and the premium brands that you go to will have a very good additive selection in there. Let me know in the comments what your preferred fuel station is and if you notice much of a difference if you switch to another brand. Years ago, when you had a carburetor and things were a bit more clunky, you probably saw a little bit more of an improvement with these additives. But in a modern engine, everything's computer to control. You've effectively got a lab controlling the burn inside a modern engine. So it's unlikely that fuel additives will make that much of a difference. So that brings us to octane. Higher octane fuel means you get better fuel economy. Well, again, that's a sort of myth for some people, but it's true for others. It depends on the engine you've got. So generally speaking, if you have a direct injection, high compression engine or a turbocharged engine, you'll generally see that they have been designed to run on higher octane fuels. If the engine has been designed for higher octane fuel, you will generally see more power and better fuel economy. But for those of you that are driving a car that hasn't been optimized for high octane fuel, you are wasting your money. You're not going to see any benefit at all from that more expensive fuel. And think as well about the cost. You may get more fuel economy, but are you paying more per mile? Look at that cost per mile, factor that in when you do your calculation. If the high octane fuel has a higher cost per mile, you may as well use the lower octane fuel if it's safe to do so in your engine, obviously. Also in the UK, you'll note that higher octane fuel often comes with less ethanol content. So it's typically about 5% ethanol in the high octane fuels, whereas it's 10% ethanol in the low octane fuels. So again, some of the older engines will struggle to use the 10% ethanol mix. And some engines just prefer that 5% ethanol and the higher octane fuel. So really to work out if that's a myth, you need to try it. Reset your trip computer, see how many miles you get on a tank of the premium high octane fuel, and then compare that with how many miles you get on the lower octane fuel. And then look at the cost of both and average that out per mile. And then you'll see if it's cheaper to use high octane fuel. But there is no definitive answer. There's videos out here in YouTube land that say that you'll always get better fuel economy. Well, that's not always true. And there's videos that say you don't see any improvement at all. Well, again, that's not always true. It's unique. Every engine is different. Every driver is different. Every situation is unique. So you really do need to experiment and play around with that in order to determine determine whether that myth is true for you or not. Another myth we hear is that filling up in the morning saves gas. So the idea is that the 
gas, the petrol, the diesel that we put into our tank is colder. So you get more for your money. Kind of makes sense when you think about it like that. But the reality is that the fuel is under the ground in a storage tank. Temperatures under the ground tend to be fairly stable, whatever the temperature above ground is. So the fuel is not necessarily that much colder. So the benefits on that one are certainly very, very questionable. Idling to warm up the engine. I've done videos on warming up engines. Idling is what people do in very, very cold climates. They need to get some heat into the engine, but it's generally much better to just put the engine under a little bit of load. Hold the accelerator very slightly. So if it's idling at 1000 RPM, you press the accelerator to 1100, 1200, depending on the overall rev range of your engine. You certainly don't want to be pushing it too hard when that engine is cold, but that bring the engine up to temperature much more quickly and you have the potential for less problems. Oil dilution is always a bit of a problem when you're in that warm-up phase when everything in the engine is cold and not properly bedded in. So I've done other videos that go into that so I'm not going to labour that point in this video but idling to warm up your engine is generally not a great idea. There's other ways and for most drivers in normal climates just get in and drive it drive it gently until the engine warms up. The warm engine is going to be more efficient than a cold engine. So if you can save your journeys for one day, you're not doing lots of short journeys on cold engines, that will lead to a fuel saving because the engine is warm. You're not going through that wasteful warm up cycle every time you get in the car. You might find that filling up when it's still dark, there's less of a queue, the roads are clear. So there might be a fuel saving there because you can get to the pump more easily. But other than that, I think we've got to chalk that one up as just a pure myth. Sounds sensible if you think about it a certain way, but when you start thinking about all the factors and all the variables, it doesn't make any sense at all. Manual transmission saves fuel, automatic transmission waste fuel. Well, again, over the years, things have changed dramatically. We're talking about transmissions back then that had a torque converter, maybe three gears. That is going to be very wasteful compared to a full speed manual gearbox with an overdrive. But modern automatics have come a long way. We've got dual clutch systems. We've got seven or eight gears now becoming a standard on automatic boxes. The gear changes are instantaneous. The computer control the gear selection is becoming cleverer and smarter and it's able to maintain better fuel economy than most drivers selecting the manual gears themselves. So while a manual transmission may appear to give better fuel economy, the modern robot controlled automatics, the Tiptronics, the S-Tronics and similar gearboxes from other manufacturers go a long way to maximizing the fuel economy. Most people get fairly near to the manufacturer's claimed economy figures if they drive gently and let the auto box do its thing. But that's obviously going to depend very much on your driving style. But again, people say the lighter the car, the more weight you shed, the greater the fuel economy. So that's kind of true. If you've got lots of things in your car and it's weighing the car down, the car's got to overcome that inertia. But the reality is that in the main, you won't see that much of a difference going silly. So when people start choosing lighter screws, drilling holes in subframes, using lighter components, carbon fiber panels, and that sort of thing, just to save fuel economy, you've generally outweighed the cost of the fuel saving in the long term by the parts that you've bought that are lighter. And you've made the car more noisy. Removing sound deadening is one of the things that people do to save weight in a car. And you've got to think about the practicality of it. So there are limits. Don't carry around half a ton of scrap metal in the back of the car just because it's there and you couldn't be bothered to clear it out. So that would be wasteful. But going silly and starting to look at tiny little things, taking out pieces of paper and pens in order to save fuel, that's starting to go to the extreme. And you're not really going to see any benefit at all by going to those extremes. Another fuel economy myth is that electric cars are cheaper in terms of fuel. Now, that's got some elements of truth. If you can charge at home and you've got an economy tariff, you're going to be making a saving. It's generally cheaper to use that electricity at that cheap price than it would be to put fuel, petrol, diesel, gas gasoline, whatever you call it, into your car. But if you're public charging, if you're relying on the charge network around the country, for most drivers and in most areas, that can prove to be very expensive and more so than the conventional fuels. Even if you're relying on the economy tariffs at home, you might find you need to charge it for a longer period than you actually get through that economy period. So a 30 mile top up charge can take about three hours on a domestic three pin plug. 24 hours would be needed for a full charge. So if you're only doing 20 to 30 miles a day, you can just top it up and you've got a fairly short recharge time. Obviously, if you use 
a higher kilowatt charger, you're going to reduce those charge times. But even on a 7.4 kilowatt charge, a full charge in many electric cars is still going to take you seven hours. So that'll usually push you well outside of these economy tariffs that are provided. So think as well about the mileage you do because that's a bearing. So that's sort of true for some drivers in some situations that are doing low mileage and they can top their car up at home. But generally, if you're relying on the public charge network, it usually proves to be more expensive to drive an electric car. So believing these common myths and perpetuating them is not really helping anyone. It's better to maintain a steady speed to concentrate on good anticipation on driving style. I've got other videos that go into driving economically and just help equip us as a driver to be better prepared to be economical drivers. When it comes to fuel saving, science, proper maintenance and a good driving standard is much better than an old wife's tale or a myth that people have been bandying about. Please boot the like button. That really does help us to get out there. I've lined this video up for you. And if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do so because we'd hate you to miss out on all the great content we've got coming up to help you get the best out of your car and extract every drop of performance and distance out of the fuel that you use. See you in this next video. Thanks for watching.